Have you ever wondered how closely the characters in The Flash resemble their comic book counterparts? Some are spot on. This is new. New world, new look. Some are close enough for TV work, and some not so much. For the last six seasons, fans of The Flash have watched their favorite heroes and most hated villains spring from the comic pages to the small screen. But how faithful have these adaptations been? Hey folks, welcome to The Binger. In this video, we're going to look at the differences between the comic book and live action versions of the characters in The Flash. Not in the mood for chit chat, gotcha. Ready when you are. Much like any strong character, Barry Allen has gone through some changes during the show's six seasons. Not only has he tangled with Central City's most vile villains as the Scarlet Speedster, he's also gotten married, learned he was a father, and faced his deepest lifelong traumas. Just as the character has endured changes and adapted to new situations, so has his costume. Seems comfy. Yours is pretty cool. Smooth. Seems safe it's and breathable. The Flash's costume in the show's sixth season comes the closest of any small screen version to the classic outfit seen in the comics. However, the resemblance between the character on the printed page and his counterpart of the CW show wasn't always so apparent. The first version of the TV costume looked more like a set of dark red motorcycle leathers than the bright red spandex from the comics. Also, the iconic wings on the boots and the cowl laid flush on the surface for the TV version, rather than protruding from the figure on the page. The biggest difference? In the comics, Barry Allen has short blonde hair. In real life, actor Grant Gustin has dark hair. Barry's longtime love interest in both the comics and the TV series is Iris West. When she first appeared in the comics in 1956's Showcase Issue No. 4, she was a young journalist at Central City's Picture News. Much like her TV counterpart, she was a strong, independent woman who had a passion for pursuing the truth. Eventually, she uncovered the truth. Barry Allen and The Flash were one and the same. She would keep his secret, just as she kept her vows when the couple married in Flash issue 165 in 1966. She would take that secret to the grave when she passed away in Flash issue 275 in 1979. When the TV series premiered in 2014, the producers wanted to reflect the diverse society of the new century in their casting choices. I do believe we found the solution we're looking for. They chose Candace Patton, a veteran of daytime soaps and primetime dramas, to play the strong and supportive Iris. While comic Iris was white, TV Iris was African American, a casting choice that drew some skepticism at the time. However, Patton's powerful performances have helped her establish her status as the iconic version of Iris West Allen. Always have to make an entrance, don't you, Kid Flash? What can I say? If there's a comic book hero who's undergone more changes than Wally West, you'd be hard pressed to find one. He started out as a sidekick to The Flash, appropriately named Kid Flash, in Flash issue 110 from 1959. The new outfit would have an open top cowl, a yellow upper body with a red lightning bolt, red pants, and bright yellow boots. When Barry sacrificed himself in the 1985 miniseries Crisis on Infinite Earths, Wally would take on the mantle of The Flash, wearing his mentor's original costume. The TV version of Kid Flash would wear a similar outfit, but with a more leathery look than the comic book source. He received a version of the suit as a Christmas present from Iris, who recognized that Wally was on his way to becoming a hero in his own right. In both versions, Wally is related to Iris West. Thus, the TV version is also African American, played by Australian actor Keenan Lonsdale. In another subtle difference, comics Wally is Iris' nephew, while TV Wally is Iris' estranged younger brother. While several different versions of the Killer Frost character inhabit the pages of DC Comics, the TV version blends many of the best aspects of each version. The first comics version of Killer Frost appeared in Firestorm issue number 3 in 1978. Crystal Frost was a physicist who was in love with Professor Martin Stein, one half of the superhero Firestorm. Louise Lincoln, a colleague and friend of the original Killer Frost, took up the villainous identity. Along with the cryokinetic power set in Firestorm issue number 21 in 1984. While both of these lethal and lovely ladies wore distinctive outfits during their criminal careers, none of their frozen fashions made it to the small screen. In the Arrowverse, the title of Killer Frost belongs to Dr. Caitlin Snow, played by Danielle Panabaker. Instead of transforming into a human icicle, Caitlin Snow's hair turns from a soft brown to a harsh white, while her eyes go from brown to ice blue. Her fashion choices are also much more practical, as she typically sports blue or black leather to complement her pale complexion. 
Very few characters in the history of comics scream 80s more than Vibe. His first appearance in Justice League of American Annual No. 2 in 1984 had him set up to be a big-time player. However, his choices in costuming had him set up as a punchline for decades to come. Hey everybody, my name is Vibe, and I'm gonna shake things up! The neckline that plunges past his navel, the wide flaring shoulder pads, the green goggles, the red booties. Did all the top heroes quit the Justice League to make room for this clown? Actually, yes, that's exactly what happened. The character was such a laughing stock that DC announced in 2009 that they would publish a Vibe Rebirth miniseries as an April Fool's joke. Thankfully, the brain trust behind the Flash TV series took the character a bit more seriously and dressed him to reflect that seriousness. Engineering genius Cisco Ramon, played by Carlos Valdez, designed a costume that both enhanced his powers and didn't make him look like an idiot. His quilted leather jacket helped him withstand the powerful vibrations from his wrist gauntlets, while his goggles helped him focus on creating portals to alternate universes. In both the comics and the TV series, Barry Allen was not the first hero to carry the name Flash. The first comics version of The Flash appeared in, appropriately enough, Flash Comics Issue 1 in 1940. In his debut, Jay Garrick inhaled hard water fumes which gave him super speed. He created a costume from a red sweater and blue pants, each decorated with yellow lightning bolts. His trademark was his wide-brimmed steel helmet, which he used to cast a shadow over his face rather than wearing a mask. The helmet had yellow wings attached to each side, which Garrick styled after Mercury, the Roman god of speed. Most of these design elements made it into the TV version of the character, played by John Wesley Shipp. Much like the TV versions of most superhero costumes, Garrick's outfit resembled those worn by professional motorcycle riders. While the comics version featured a red sweater as the top, TV Garrick had a zippered jacket with chest plates for protection. The lightning accents in the TV version are also much more subtle than those in his comic counterpart's outfit. Now that we've covered the heroes, it's time to bring on the bad guys. Speak for yourself, I was a great criminal. Mick Rory, the super criminal known as Heat Wave, made his first comics appearance in Flash issue 140 in 1963. This issue would also mark the first terrifying team up between Heat Wave and yellow Flash foe Captain Cold. In his debut, Heat Wave wore a white fireproof suit made of asbestos, with orange goggles and an orange holster for his heat gun. Decades later, his outfit would feature that quintessential 90s accessory pouches. Oh, so many pouches. While this costume may have been suitable for its time, the demands of television and the dangers of asbestos required a change of clothing. In the TV show, Rory, played by Dominic Purcell, sported a pair of goggles similar to his comic book inspiration. TV Rory's goggles were rounded instead of rectangular, and had a special coating to protect his eyes from the intense light and heat his flamethrower generated. He also ditched the asbestos onesie for a more functional leather jacket and welder's gloves. This outfit makes him look less like a supervillain and more like a construction worker. You'd think that a Heat-themed villain and a Cold-themed baddie wouldn't get along. Yet Heat Wave and Captain Cold have been partners in both the comics and the TV series. Len Snart, aka Captain Cold, made his first comics appearance in Showcase issue number 8. The Master of Absolute Zero sported a blue snowsuit with white fur trim around the hood, along with blue slitted sunglasses. The outfit took some of its stylings from native tribes of the polar region, such as the Inuit. TV's Captain Cold, played by Wentworth Miller, would keep the fur-trimmed hood, but ditch many of the other elements from that look. His goggles, much like those worn by his hot-tempered partner, had a protective coating to prevent snow blindness. Fun fact, Purcell and Miller starred together in the hit Fox TV series Prison Break from 2005 to 2009. Their chemistry from that series carried on to their work on The Flash. However, there is no truth to the rumor that the pair will get their own spin-off show, nor that the theme song would be titled A Song of Ice and Fire. I didn't see that coming. When it comes to translating a character from page to screen, there are just some looks that can't be pulled off in live action. Take the fearsome Flash foe known as Savitar. Savitar made his first appearance in Flash Volume 2, Issue 108 in 1995. If Vibe's costume screamed 80s, then Savitar's outfit yelled 90s. The gold metallic half-mask resembles the design for the Silver Age Kid Flash. The gold arm bracers and wide gold belt look heavy enough to weigh down even the speediest speedster. At least he's not weighed down by a shirt as a bolt of electricity slashes his bare chest. 
On the page, the outfit, if you want to call it that, looks silly. In live action, it goes from ridiculous to impossible. Rather than duplicate this travesty, the talented troops behind the scenes at the Flash TV show took another approach. You know me. I love a good myth. Their version of Savitar was simply a silver metallic suit slashed with blue glowing lights to represent the Speed Force. The suit also has metallic claws that extend from the wrist, much like a merry mutant from DC's Marvelous Rivals. Since this list started with The Flash, it's only fitting that it ends with his opposite number. The Reverse Flash made his first comics appearance in 1963 in The Flash issue 139. The villain's costume was the literal reverse of these Scarlet Speedsters. Yellow instead of red, red in place of yellow, a black circle instead of a white one. This sinister speedster was a scientist named Eobard Thawne. Thawne was from the 25th century, an era with such advanced technology that crime became unnecessary, as did superheroes. Thawne learned all he could about the Flash, and the more he learned, the more he hated the hero. His hatred led him to make a reverse copy of the Flash's costume and find a way to tap into the Speed Force, the source of the Flash's powers. The TV version shares a similar origin story, as well as a similar costume design. While the TV suit isn't as shockingly bright as the comics version, its toned-down color scheme represents the opposite of the TV Flash's costume. In many ways, Reverse Flash's outfit represents the truest translation from comics to screen in the series. So, what'd you think? Did we leave any major differences off the list? Let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to like this video, share it with your Flash fan friends, and subscribe to The Binger to get notified about our latest videos. Thanks a lot for watching.